RMC is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your retro gaming with their joysticks featuring genuine Sanwar arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. What do you get when you take a 1989 Sega Mega Drive or Genesis if you're in North America and smash it into an IBM PC compatible? Well, two answers I can think of are this. This is the Terra Drive and we're in Gary's house here. We took a retro road trip to Gary's house to see his exotic Japanese collection of computers and this is one of them, a 286 PC with a built-in Sega Mega Drive. And hopefully someday Gary will bring that into the cave for a show and tell so we can get more familiar with it. And the other answer is this, the Amstrad Mega PC. I picked this up for £100 thanks to Andy, who sold it to me on the understanding that the condition is unknown, it may well be completely broken, and that I look after it in the cave and don't sell it on. I think that's a fair deal because these go on their own in working condition for about 350 to 400 pounds at the moment, and that's eBay prices. And it's certainly not the first Amstrad that's come into the cave. Amstrad, a company that we recently explored with their PC1512 and PC1640 models on this channel. Those were their first steps into IBM PC compatibles in the 80s, and despite a successful start capturing the lion's share of the European PC market, they were unable to build on that success, in part due to rumours of reliability problems and then actual reliability problems with their machines. And you can learn all about that period of Amstrad's history. There's a link in the description below to that video. By 1989, Amstrad released the PC-2000, and that really was marred by problems. Problems with the Western digital hard drive controllers in that machine really cemented the reputation of Amstrad for being not quite as reliable as they should be, despite their best efforts to rectify the situation. The reputation was sealed, and they lost that lion's share of the European PC market. In 1986, they had sales growth of 123%, and that was never to be repeated by the company. The 90s really were a tough time for Amstrad. Unlike, say, Steve Jobs, who was driven by producing the perfect one or two products, Alan Sugar here really was driven by profit and profit alone, and he would dive into any and every product he could think of to make a profit, whether it be the Amstrad emailer, a home telephone with internet connection before we were all quite so widely connected to the net, whether it be the PCW, a very low-powered computer specifically geared towards word processing, or out of that thinking, what we're looking at here today, the Amstrad Mega PC. In fact, you can just think of Alan Sugar on a flight, maybe off to New York, mulling over in his head what the next product would be. What is it that people want to spend their hard-earned cash on today? Well, they like games consoles and they like PCs, I know. I'll put them together and that makes me filthy rich, I tells you. Call blimey, Mary Poppins. That was uncanny. It was like he was in the room. What he did then was he took a IBM PC compatible, a 386 from their range. He took a Sega Mega Drive and he smashed them together. And he did this, of course, with a license from Sega. This was an officially licensed product. And this was the result. Well, this, but a lot less yellow, and we'll maybe try and fix that later. This fairly compact desktop PC is quite unremarkable at first glance, and it would have been bundled with a 14-inch CRT monitor, keyboard, mouse, and joypad, and I think it also came with a analog PC joystick. Looking at it head-on, it's a standard PC, but when we slide this front fascia across, it reveals its party piece, a cartridge slot and two joypad ports, into which we can plug an Amstrad-branded Mega Drive joypad, if we had one, or a regular Sega pad, and a Mega Drive cartridge. It's officially licensed from Sega, and it's a fun idea. It's not the only example of such a configuration, the Terra Drive being another. There is a difference between the two, though. The Terra Drive integrates the PC with the Mega Drive, so you can actually use it as a development system or run software that utilizes hardware from both sides, the PC and the Mega Drive, at the same time. Our Amstrad is a much more binary affair, though. You're either in Mega Drive mode or PC mode, and the click of a switch behind the fascia when you slide it disables most of the Mega Drive when we're in PC mode. I say most because it's not true to say that there's zero integration between the two sides, and I'll explain more when we open it up. 
In the style of an Atari ST, the keyboard and mouse port sit underneath the front of the unit here, and around the back, again, it's fairly unremarkable with a couple of serial ports, a parallel port, and a video out port. What does stand out though is that there's an expansion card with a 15-pin connector. That's for a PC joystick or a MIDI device, and it also has a 3.5mm audio jack. That's not unusual in its own right, but this expansion card, as we'll see when we open the case, is an ISA card, and it has the Mega Drive components on it. So, what business does a Mega Drive card have with a PC joystick port on it? What business indeed? There's only one way to find out. Let's take it over to the lab, open it up, and see what's inside. Are you coming with us, Alan? No, I'll stay here, mate. Um, fine, suit yourself, mate. Hmm, what if I combined a Super Nintendo with a food processor? That could work. <laughs> On opening the PC up, we can see that ISA card on the right, but sadly I can also immediately spot another problem, the plague of old PCs. It's a leaking battery tucked down here. That battery is used to retain the clock and BIOS settings, and it's begun to spew its corrosive guts up on the board. You can see the green fuzz and the dark patches on the tracks where the corrosion is taking hold. If we'd have any chance of seeing this in action and it surviving in the longer term, we do need to clean this up. Our Mega Drive board though, that's an ISA card which is effectively a Mega Drive on a board. You've got a Z80 and a 68000 CPU, the Sega video chip and RAM for the device exactly as you would find in a Mega Drive. There's also the Yamaha YM2612 sound chip. Audio of course a vital part of the full Mega Drive experience. The fun part though is that the PC uses this chip as an ad-lib compatible sound card, hence the MIDI joystick port on the back of the ISA card. So while the Mega Drive is mostly dormant, the PC does continue to use that chip. And when using the Mega Drive, this cable here carries the video signal down to the PC's motherboard where it's output via the regular SVGA video port on the back. There's no fancy upscaling taking place here to make it work on an SVGA monitor. Amstrad shipped this with a multi-sync monitor and then used some of the SVGA pins which are normally ground to tell the Amstrad monitor to kick into the 15 kilohertz mode when the Mega Drive was active and it also sends audio to the monitor's speakers. As I don't have an Amstrad monitor, that's a problem we'll need to overcome to see the machine working in full. So given what we know of the condition already, I guess the best thing we can do is strip it right down so we can see the PC side of things and try to repair it so we can actually see it working. If you bought a PC in 1993, the likelihood was that you wanted a 486 or even a Pentium processor. March 93 was when the first Pentium processor was released and that will give you an indication as to how successful the Mega PC was or wasn't. Looking here, you can see how that battery leak has worked its way into the floppy drive cable. It's amazing how the damage can spread, and yet another reminder, even if you have no repair skills, just to get some snips and cut those batteries out. To be brutally honest, nobody wanted a 386 PC in 1993, and we certainly didn't want to pay the retail price of £999 for the privilege. The Mega Drive was in its fourth year, so the likelihood was that if you wanted one, you'd have already gone out and bought one for about £100, instead of the £1,000 you'd be paying for this with an underpowered PC bolted on. Amstrad also made a more powerful version of this, the Mega Plus, with a 486 CPU and 4 megabytes of RAM, but I can't find any evidence that that actually made it to market, or if it did, it was in extremely low volumes. That hasn't, however, stopped some enthusiasts from sourcing a 486 compatible board and actually upgrading the machine themselves. That's our PC stripped down then, and a quick tour of the board reveals our CPU here. That's an AMD branded 386SX at 25MHz, and that's soldered directly onto the board. And there's also a slot for a Matsco processor, so an upgrade isn't out of the question for a little boost. Likewise, the Western Design Center SVGA graphics chip has 256K of video RAM with sockets to upgrade that to 512 if desired. And we've got 4 megabytes of SIM RAM fitted, which is a nice upgrade over the stock 1 megabytes of RAM, so this machine has been upgraded somewhere along the way. Noticeable around the board are areas for additional RAM modules, an SVGA feature connector, and a joystick port, but they're all absent. Non-essential parts no doubt removed from the bill of materials to reduce cost. 
Amstrad also sold this PC without the Mega PC 3H40 games card, as it was officially known, and a different front fascia as the Amstrad PC 7386SX. On then to the job of repairing the board, and that battery damage has been working its way around the rear of the underside of the board as well as the top. You can see the mask over the tracks, perhaps even the tracks themselves being eaten away here. So our priority now is to ensure those traces are complete, try to avoid further damage to the machine, and get that nasty battery out of here and disposed of. We will want to replace the battery, but the PC will also work without it, it just won't retain its settings. So let's get this fixed up, and we'll see what happens. Repairing a leak like this will take several passes. My first goal is to assess the damage and see if the machine is fixable rather than to perform an immaculate cleaning job on what may be an irreparable machine. We'll start by cleaning the area up with some isopropyl alcohol and cotton buds to remove surface dirt and some of the battery leakage. Then a liberal amount of white vinegar goes into the area, applied with a cotton bud, and we'll just give that a few minutes to go to work. The acidic vinegar is neutralising the alkaline nature of that battery leak, so providing we reach all parts of it we should be able to stop further damage. What follows then is a fingertip clean with the cotton buds and an anti-static brush and more isopropyl alcohol to try and get between the legs of those chips which looked a little fuzzed up. The process repeated on the rear of the board, and as we do this we start to get an idea of how bad the damage is or isn't. If chunks of green solder mask start lifting off or tracks are obviously falling apart before your eyes, then you likely have a big job on your hands. But in this instance the corrosion only seems to be surface deep so far. We might actually be lucky here. What I'm doing next is looking for the tracks affected by corrosion, those dark patches where it's eating away at them. I'm just scraping away the affected area with a scalpel. I'm not digging into the board or trying to cut anything away, just gently brushing over the area when you can feel that it's rougher, pitted and damaged. We want to remove the corroded surface to reveal the copper of the track below. You may also want to attempt this with a fiberglass pen, I personally like being able to feel the surface through the blade when working on it. And remember, we'll make further passes to clean this up at this point. This is not supposed to be a perfect cleanup job yet, we're just assessing the suitability of the board. The top of the board also got the same treatment. Two areas which can cause problems here are the vias, that's the holes the tracks dive through to get to the other side of the board, and things like nearby capacitors or disk drive pins may have corrosion in places we can't see, underneath them for example. If all goes well I will recap this board and will assess the drive pins as we go. With the first pass of neutralising and cleaning complete, I'm checking all of the traces for continuity. This wasn't too difficult as they were easy enough to see with the naked eye, so it was just a case of methodically checking all of them. Pleasingly, we had a nearly 100% success rate. It appears we caught this leak just before it could eat too far into the board and cause massive damage. Just one track was found to be incomplete. That's one near the floppy drive connector, so let's give you a closer look under the microscope here. The track is broken right at the via. As I've been scraping, the whole copper has come away from the via and from that part of the track. And as we look down into the holes of the other vias, you can still see green funk sitting in some of them. Plenty more cleaning still to be done, otherwise that will just sit in there and rot away. So to complete this broken circuit, I've simply put a patch cable into the via, soldered it to the track, and on the underside trimmed it flush and donked, yes donking is now a soldering term, donked a blob of solder on top, and all of our traces now have full continuity. With that repaired, the question then is, will it blend? No, not will it blend, will it boot? <laughs> Let's find out. So the question after all of that is, does it work? 
Well, let me show you a few of the changes I've made before I tested it. The first thing is I took out the hard drive. If you look at the screws on the top, you can see that the seals are broken. Something has changed inside this hard drive at some point. Perhaps the controller inside was swapped out, uh, but regardless, it doesn't work anymore. I can't get any life out of that whatsoever. So I swapped that out with a compact flash adapter and that will probably stay in there permanently, to be honest. I do like these compact flash adapters as swap outs for mechanical drives. Despite losing that lovely sound of a drive spinning up, it's altogether more practical. Likewise, the floppy drive I've swapped out for an SD floppy emulator, so I've got my floppy disks on an SD card. That's just made everything a lot easier for testing. I've installed MS-DOS 6.22. Legally, of course, I do have a copy, and I can tell you that's working absolutely fine. And I've also installed Windows 3.1.1. The reason for that is, where the corrosion's got around the board, I didn't want to just give you a power-on test and say, hey, look, guys, it, it works, when actually the floppy controller, the hard drive controller, some, some other part of the system may have been affected by some of that corrosion, and we just didn't see it until we put it to use. So I've given it a good, a thorough test. Let me turn it on now for you. The first thing you'll notice when we turn it on is that it tells us our battery is dead. In fact, our battery is completely missing. It's not just dead. And that means it can't remember the settings. So I do need to input them every time I turn it on until we get that battery replaced. So let's go into the settings screen. And this looks like a BIOS much like any other. We can hit F9 for automatic configuration. But what we don't have is automatic settings of our hard disk, our compact flash adapter. So we'll just put the settings in for that. And when we reboot it now, it runs the memory test to confirm that we do have four megabytes of RAM installed, which lines up with the SIMs we saw on the motherboard. And there it is, it's booting into MS-DOS, so that's working absolutely fine. I've also installed Windows 3.1.1 and had a play with that. There it is on the screen there now. So from the PC side of things, everything's working absolutely fine. So the question is, what about the Mega Drive? Well, if you take a look at the Mega Drive card here on the front, you can see the cartridge slot. You can also see a little switch, a little pressure switch above that. And what that does is that detects if I've actually pushed a cartridge in. It won't put power into the board until that switch is pushed in. So to switch over to Mega Drive mode, while Windows is running, we don't need to switch anything off. We'll just flick this switch here, which would normally be activated by sliding the front of the Mega PC. We'll flick that. The screen goes black, nothing's happening. We'll put the cartridge in. That pressure switch is pushed, and immediately our screen here tells us that we're not in a supported screen resolution mode, so it's not displaying a picture. However, if I grab my headphones, that is the unmistakable tune of Ghosts and Goblins. That's Ghouls and Ghosts, you idiot. Volume slider. There we go. The reason we're not seeing anything on the screen here is as soon as this board activates, the output from the VGA port here kicks into 15 kilohertz mode and that's not supported by this monitor. I have tried it on this, this is a TV over here with a SCART input. So I've taken uh, a cable from the SVGA port here into SCART into here, but that doesn't display anything either. And the reason for that, having looked at the mega PC forums out there, is because it doesn't understand the sync from the signal. You need a C-Sync in order for anything to display. Although I do have a device called an OSSC, which apparently does support the output from this, providing you use the right firmware. The only problem is that device has gone away for repair. I had some problems with it and it hasn't come back yet. So in part two, on that's back, we can prove that that's the case and hopefully have both sides of this working from one monitor using the OSSC. Or alternatively, I just need to find the original Amstrad monitor. I just need to find, he says flippantly, they're very rare. I doubt I'll come across one, but you never know. Now here's the fun bit. If we were to slide the front of the Mega PC back across again and put it back into PC mode, well, we pick up exactly where we left off. The PC didn't turn off at any moment. So you could have a word processing document or a spreadsheet up that you're working on. You stop for a quick Mega Drive game and then you go back to PC mode and your work's still there, you can carry on working. I think that's quite a nice feature. So what next then for our Amstrad Mega PC? Well, we need to finish up that cleaning up. We'll get in there with the fiberglass tipped pen to make sure we've got all of the corrosion off. We'll clean up all the legs and all of the components. I think I would be a fool not to remove the floppy drive header pins. 
there's very likely to be corrosion under those pins and it's just going to eat away at it. So I think the sensible thing would be to take them out and swap them out. We should recap the board, especially the capacitors near to that corrosion. So that won't take long. There's not too many capacitors. Well, we have the iron out. We might as well replace the capacitors on the Mega Drive board. So we'll get them swapped out. Cosmetically, we need to clean up the front, maybe some retro writing to try and get it looking as good as new. And then finally, going back to the corrosion on the tracks, what we'll need to do is seal off those tracks from oxygen because corrosion, of course, needs oxygen for, for the rust, basically, because that's what corrosion is. It's essentially rust. It's oxidizing and it needs oxygen for that process. So we'll need to seal off those tracks that we've cleaned up to make sure that corrosion doesn't begin again. And after all of that, I think we should plonk in a maths coprocessor. And if we can find it some extra video RAM to really upgrade this to the maximum spec that I can get it to without swapping it out for a 486 board. And we can demonstrate both the PC side and the Mega Drive side so we can get a full picture of exactly what the Amstrad Mega PC is capable of. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. As always, thank you for watching. See you next time and take care. I've had a few more ideas, mate. How about a Dragon 32 with a food processor, a Famicom with a fridge, a Spectrum with a toilet, a New Brain with a Breville, a Sam Coupe with an ice cream maker, a BBC Micro with a banana peeler, an Atari ST with a kettle, an Amiga with a deep fat fryer, you know, I do sausages for the kids, a CPC with a fondue bowl thing, a video recorder with another video recorder in it. Nah, can't see a market for that one. A portable digital music player. Nah, that's, that's stupid. No one will buy that ever. 